Well, good morning. Welcome once again to Garden America. We are back in the studio. It is Garden America. I'm Brian Maine. Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco literally is on assignment. Now, we use that term a lot when people are missing or they're gone, and it's usually not true, but he is definitely on assignment. He's actually bidding on a rose for me right now. George Burns just got a text from John. So welcome to the show. Our uh, special guest today, Tiger, go ahead and introduce our friend. Yeah, we have our friend joining us this morning, Craig Madden. Um, Craig Madden's been a longtime friend of the show. You've been on our show, what, maybe three or four times already? A few, yeah. Yeah. So Craig's with Yard to Table Creations? Correct. Right? And, um, you know, your specialty is edible landscapes. In, in edible landscapes in general, like we're not just talking vegetable gardens. We're talking fruit trees. We're talking berry bushes. We're talking everything that you can eat out of your garden, right? If you can eat it, I'm into it. <laughs> oh, is that is that your, your moniker? <laughs> no, it, it, maybe it is now. On T-shirts and bumper stickers? <laughs> it should be. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Yeah, we, was it a couple of years ago that we had you on? Yeah, uh, yeah a couple of times. I, last yeah. year and the yeah. year before. Right. Yeah. So, uh and it's table to or no yard to table yard to table because yeah. I think I said table to yard one time <laughs> during the interview. D- very different. Got a very lot of laughs. D- very different show. Right Absolutely. There, yeah. So those of you tuned in right now, welcome. Yes, we were off last week. Thank you for the kind words, uh, having us back again. We took the uh, weekend off, so we are back. It's going to be a good show. We have an in-studio guest, obviously. Nobody on the phone. Yeah. So all your questions, your comments on Facebook Live, feel free. And uh, we'll have a good show. Those on BizTalk Radio, this is a pre-recorded show from last week. And that is the FCC disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, this morning, since it is winter still, you know, it's so crazy to think. I mean, obviously we are not being affected by the ice storm that is crossing the country at this moment in Nobody time. Nobody de-ices their car in San Diego. <laughs> but it is still winter. And so this is the time of year we want to talk about winter food. And we can talk about, you know, what you could be planting, what you are growing, maybe what you're harvesting, and then what you're, you know, you're you need to take care of in the sense of pruning or lacing or thinning right now. And you know, this is Craig's specialty because right. this is what his uh, company does for people. You actually go to people's homes and do all of that for them, so they just get to reap the uh, benefits the rewards, of all right? the rewards, right? Assuming all goes well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's where you come in. You're the professional. So yeah. all does go well, right, Craig? Uh, yeah, I would, I'm not going to say 100% of the time. Gardening is not perfect. But, you know, it, it. of course, you know, my job is to bring their garden and their fruit tree orchards up to the maximum, you know, production level that we can. And, and also to make it work best for their household. What, so what is your background from, from the time a long time ago to where we are now? What, uh, give us your background, how you got into this. Uh, it was a meandering path. Uh, I, oh. I was in school for psychology working as a carpenter uh 2008 happened and i followed a dream uh, when the housing market crashed to go to culinary school and become a chef i worked as a chef for 10 years Um, naturally through cooking i got into gardening um, just wanting more control over my own food learning about the food system and how much i didn't want to be a part of that right and then when i got real tired of working in kitchens and not being home with my family i decided to take those three skills and smash them into a business all this food you're cooking where did this come from who grew it yeah how how does it get to me or the grocery store all that kind yeah of- and the more i learned about the system the less i wanted to be a part of it so the more i wanted to just grow my own food have right. control over the nutritional value of what was going on at the same time we had had a new baby mm-hmm. so my perspective on life in general was changing pretty drastically and so for the first year of her life i grew all the food she ate you know it's interesting you mentioned that tiger can back me up on this i've got a small patio i grow with citrus i have the veggie pod that you now have cilantro different things everything i grew in my patio everything has always tasted better than the store yeah just without a doubt even if you don't know what you're doing 100 percent. and it's like my my wife's like man this citrus is good this is sweet this is really good i'm like and i'm like yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a citrus grower, <laughs> and I'm thinking, what did I do except give it some food a little bit, some water, and let the sun and the environment do the rest? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, and then I'm sure as a, a person who loves to cook, the other thing that um, a chef, a, a cook is restricted by is what's available. And, Correct. You know, that's, I mean, there are wonderful uh, farmer's markets. There's, uh, you know, a company here in San Diego called Specialty Produce, which brings in a wide variety of unique uh, fruits and vegetables as well. But when you're going to a grocery store, you get, you know, navel orange, you know, eureka lemon. Right. You know, you you get very uh, limited sources of uh, variety. Um, But when you get to 
plant your own seeds, uh, plant your own plant, and then have that fruit down the road, it allows you to be open to more things, which, which here in San Diego County, yeah. too, it's very rare. I mean, unless you're looking for a cherry, you, you know, you don't have, you know, you kind of have a lot of options here to be able to plant things here in San Diego. So it's yeah. nice that you, if you're interested in creating some kind of preserve or some kind of meal, you can actually plant that plant and then have that fruit where you can't find that fruit elsewhere, right, Craig? Correct. Yeah, I mean, there, are, there's, there's a lot of we can, we're lucky here. I mean, yeah. we don't have real yeah. winter. We actually have a 12 month growing season. Uh, we can grow a lot of things. Our biggest, our the only thing that we have a problem with with growing here is not getting cold enough. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of especially trees, but there's a lot, there's a lot of plants out there that really need a frost to be successful. I'm not going to grow cherries in Scripps Ranch. Um, you <laughs> some actually I can't. Right. Some. You you can grow cherries here. I really only two varieties. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, it's limited. Yeah. Uh, other than that, and there's a lot of stone fruit. Um, the stone fruit tastes different that's grown here than it does than fruit that's grown in the Northeast. Yeah. Uh, because they actually have a long winter. Um, they get a lot sweeter. Um, they tend to be smaller. Yeah. So, um, you know, aside from, um, you know, options, Craig, again, your specialty is actually having people organize their, their garden as well. And it, I always, I, it must be amazing to talk to people because what is their sense of like real understanding of what they're going to get? You know, when somebody says, Oh, I want to plant eight lemon trees. <laughs> do you understand what a lemon tree produces? Yeah. I, you know, I, I joke that all I really do is teach people how we all lived 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, and the, the hard, I, I want to say the most rewarding, but also one of the most difficult parts of my job is actually getting people to understand how to live around a garden. Essentially, it's teaching people how to change their habits, which anybody who's tried to change a habit knows it's tough. It's really hard. And so I'm essentially coaching people through trying to get them to change their habits and being reliant on the grocery store as much. And you have to understand that most of the people that seek me out are already thinking this way. Yeah, they, they you know, they're already forward thinking about the, some of the same issues. So then it's about managing expectation. How much space do you have? How often do you cook? You know, how much of this are you going to use, which yeah. is the whole how do you make a garden work well? So I always tell my clients when we first start, give this a year because it's going to take us a year to figure it out for me to figure out your garden and for sure. you to figure out how to make your garden work for you. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, there's not a template. I mean, there's no. a basis, but not a template for well, everybody. It's not cookie cutter necessarily. I mean, it, it's like when people go shopping for plants, specifically herbs, and they look at these herbs and they see mint and they see basil and they see cilantro and they see parsley and they see oregano. And then they start looking, there's fennel, and there's tarragon, and all these other ones. And I'm like, how often do you use tarragon? <laughs> you know, have, I, have, yeah. I, I could honestly say I have never cooked with tarragon ever in my life. Yeah. Why would I plant a tarragon plant? Just because I can? No. You know? But a lot of people will use that logic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like, sure. oh, it's kind of like if I plant it, I'll, I'll, I'll cook with it and I okay maybe is that you know, the same thing as if you build it they will come yeah right you know <laughs> and I, I give pe I give people the room to make those mistakes too because I will give them my best suggestion mm -hmm. but it's not for me to really question what they're what they think they're going to use it's actually better for them to plant it and then realize oh I actually can't use yeah. you know eighty five stalks of tarragon a week because <laughs> had they not been able to do that they never would have known right and they're thinking well I should have. So, yeah. yeah, let them, you yeah. know, it's like teaching a kid to swim. Yeah. Teaching him to ride a bike. Hey, you're going to have to fall a couple of times yep. before yeah. you get it down. I mean, my job is just to make sure that they don't do anything that's going to be too hard to fix, you know, to yeah. Right. fix, fix like, it. Yeah, down the road. You know, like planting a rosemary in the middle of your garden bed. <laughs> Not a good idea. The roots are going to ruin everything, you yeah. know, but that's just something that I just have to tell them. Like, let's put it in a pot. Yeah. You know, you can have your rosemary. It's still going to be way more than you need, but let's put it in a pot by itself. Yeah, yeah, keep you know keep things it like that contained a little bit, right? Yeah, and then and then the you know help the big question I get from people is you know what do I do with all, all this? You know, the big mistake that everybody makes, the same two mistakes I saw over and over again that made me think about starting this as a business was either they would plant and then they wouldn't know what to do and it would die, so they would think, well, I can't garden. It's yeah, not true. It's just a skill. Oh, the other one is they would be successful and then not 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 know what to do with seventeen pounds of tomatoes. <laughs> You know, they take that small little six pack of tomatoes from the nursery yeah. and they throw them in and they don't realize that those six plants are actually going to take over the world. Right. We see and a lot of people bringing in 
lemons, oranges, various fruits here at the, at the radio station because now ah, you got more than you need, don't you? Yep, and I get the client that says, okay, I want an orange, and I want the Valencia, and I want a navel, and I want a Cara Cara, and I want a Eureka lemon, and I want a Meyer lemon, and I want two different limes, and I have to stop them and say, hold yeah. or, on. Or your answer is, well, what state are you feeding? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is this for California? Is this for Arizona? We, we, well, we're, we're going to put you. We're going to take a break. Yeah. And, and when we get back, I have the quote of the week. Sure. It ties perfectly what we're, what we're saying. Absolutely. So do stay with us, those on Facebook Live. Thank you so much as we get into the show. Welcoming your, your questions, your comments. I see there's some rain uh, being reported in some areas. So thank you for that weather update. We're going to take a break for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. This is Garden America. Back after these messages. All right, welcome back to the show. Happy weekend. It is uh, Saturday morning, or maybe it's a different time of the day or week because you listen to a pre-recorded show. You go to our YouTube page, Garden America Radio Show. You can find us there. Also, our website, GardenAmerica.com. Our IT guy, Daniel, really wants people to go to our website because we need the traction, we need the traffic, we need the people, and it changes periodically. It's not the same website every time you go to our website at GardenAmerica.com. We've got the quote of the week, which John usually reads. Tiger, you have it. Uh, this week from the newsletter uh, from John Bagnasco. Yeah, and it kind of ties in perfectly with what we were just talking about and people's expectations. Um, and it's from Michelangelo, Michelangelo, and he said, the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. So, you know, that, that's, something, that's a good quote. Just something to think too about easy. right there. And, um, you know, you mentioned the newsletter and the website and, the newsletter has an article that John had about one of the coolest plants that I've seen. We've had it in the nursery a couple of times, and it's the Kool-Aid plant. And I'm not even going to attempt the Latin name. But if you want to know more about the Kool-Aid plant, you can go to our website, check out the newsletter, and, and there's information. It's a really cool plant. Right, and if you want to receive the newsletter, also go to our website. You can sign up for the newsletter. It's delivered early every Friday morning, and we don't share your information. We keep it to ourselves. But there's articles, there's uh, pictures people send in of what's growing in their gardens, updates on shows and future guests. So that's GardenAmerica.com. That is our website. Sign up for the newsletter. We did the quote of the week. Uh, Craig, we're, we're, we're back with you. We're happy that you're in studio. Thank so you. Thank you so much for coming in. When we took a break, though, I want yeah. to get back on track to what we were talking about. Tyler. Well, we were talking about you know what Craig does and how he manages people's expectations about what to plant, when to plant you know, using it after the fact. And, you know, when we started off the show, we we're talking about it's winter time. And a lot of people out there thinking, oh, it's winter. There's nothing you can do. Um, so, you know, we do have those people that are in parts of the country, yeah. in parts of the world right now, where, yes, there is nothing you can do. Um, sit Six back and snow outside. Sit back, enjoy a seed catalog, and dream of warmer days. <laughs> but for us here in Southern California, there's plenty that can be done. Oh, yeah. And, Craig, let's start off with what what are you seeing people harvest right now? What are what are things that are you know you brought in some some fruit also, but what are some things that people are actually harvesting at this moment for us? Well, outside of trees, when it comes to your garden, mm-hmm. um, you can think of it this way: that summertime is all about fruit, and wintertime is all about the vegetables. Okay, there are a few fruit peas. Um, a few fruit, uh, the garden fruit. I'm not talking about trees here, yeah, but yeah. garden garden variety vegetables. It's it's all winter winter veggies so it's the leafy greens it's you know the lettuces the spinach the kales the chard you know all your brassicas your cabbages your um, brussels sprouts uh, things that as they say like to grow in the fog Um, we're lucky enough that we get to actually do that all through winter because we don't get real winter here Um, in other places this would be early spring um, early fall crops Uh, so yeah right now it's a lot of greens winter vegetable winter Gardens are green, 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 green. And you know, it's ev- interesting how you mentioned for a lot of people, it's wintertime. They, they can't do anything. Mm-hmm. So us being in San Diego, right now we've had so much rain lately 
that I got to be honest, I'm not doing much either right now. I'm keeping an eye on it, but until it warms up, I'm not really out there. I should be pulling weeds, but 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 <laughs> yeah, weeds it, are growing, no problem. The weeds are growing, no problem. But in a sense, yeah, I'm just kind of watching everything because they don't need a lot of water. I'm leaving them alone, and yeah. and I think sometimes you need to leave things alone a little bit. Well, this has got to be probably one of the best years for those winter crops for Southern California because normally we get warm mm -hmm. and that's when things bolt, when things go to flower, right? And the reason why they don't bolt or go to flowers is when it stays cool yeah. and we get this natural rain. So this is actually a, probably a really great winter crop year. This has been a stellar year compared to past years because number one, fall started on time. Mm -hmm. Normally yeah. it's 95 degrees <laughs> mid-November and yeah. all of a sudden the first week in November, it was 60 degrees. Yeah. You know, and I, I kind, I even waited to plant because I figured this oh, is gonna this up. is gonna last, <laughs> and it, and then it never really warmed up. So I said, okay, let's go, and we planted, and we got to plant relatively early. Right, um, right. I'm curious to see how quickly spring comes around. Yeah, I have a feeling spring might start a little earlier this year, which is okay because it makes the transition easier. Because things are already bolting in the garden. My, yeah. my arugula bolted just a couple of warm days, and that's all. Well, it takes. What happens though, notoriously here in San Diego, March, April starts to warm up people are like okay here we go and then yeah. it, it's cold for the next month or so yeah. again yeah. It, it's very um the weather can be psychotic here in southern california well, getting into that time of the year january and february are our coldest months out of the year mm -hmm. so people just need to remember that that even if it is a few warm days right. here in february it's you're not out of the clear yet you know maybe come march and april then you're like well, how okay, many baseball now games have you gone to in april and you're like, I need a jacket. Yeah, I, it's nice, but it's still a bit chilly. Yeah, and we've seen this with with plants. Even when the weather starts to warm up, they're like, Oh, okay, here we go. And then it gets cold. It's like, Whoa, <laughs> you know, right back down again. Uh, stone fruit trees are notorious. Stone, for yeah, that. yeah, right, exactly. So, speaking of trees, you brought in some fruit here, also, right? Yeah. Um, so, show that to the camera. There, it's on you at the moment. What is that? Yeah, that see you're if somebody can identify hand? that. It, it, is, it, it is not a dodgeball. <laughs> no, it is not a dodgeball, and it's not a grapefruit. That I think the, the first thing people might think is grapefruit. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it is not an orange. No. Mm -hmm. It's Obviously. a pomelo. 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 So a pomelo is a cross between a grapefruit and an orange. Um, it's, so I was half right. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> In a way. It's, uh, right. it, it, it has a, f a similar flavor to a grapefruit, but it's much sweeter because uh, it has the orange cross in it. And they're just kind of fun to grow because they're yeah. huge. But you yeah. don't see those. Uh, yeah. You, you don't see them because I don't think they're terribly practical. This, I would say half of this, more than half of this fruit is just thick skin. Right. Um, they taste great. Um, I was going to say, it, it sounds wonderful. You know, yeah. grapefruit, orange. But it's also just, it's not very practical. Also, from a commercial point standpoint, right. you don't see these because it's a lot of weight to move around that's not usable shipping. fruit. It's all about shipping in stores. Yeah, there's a lot. And this is why, you know, when you when you want something, it's you can grow, grow it yourself, yeah. and that's great. Now, let me ask you about the pomelo also because, um, you know, it is winter time, and grapefruits love hot. They, they they usually love hot temperatures. You know, when you when you think about growing a grapefruit, there's not a lot of varieties that grow along the coast. Where did this one come from? Do they grow along the coast? You can grow citrus along the coast. Mm -hmm. um, you get into, you run into issues that are related to having damp weather, so you get more bugs. Aphids become an issue. Um, but as long as you have a hot summer that spurs you know a flowering event, then you can grow the fruit. The problem that we have is that citrus also really need cold mm -hmm. in order to sweeten up. Mm. Um, citrus need to you know if you can drop the temperature down below forty degrees for an extended period of time, but not freezing. Your, that's when your citrus is going to be the sweetest. Oh, well, that's good to know. Good to know. I All had right. some pretty good citrus this year. Yeah. Yeah, it was cold. It's it's in the morning. It's 40, 41, 42 degrees. I mean, I have I have orchards that I've been taking care of for four years now, and the flavor difference in the same fruit that I've been eating off of the same trees year after year is drastically different this year. They're much sweeter. They're much juicier because of the weather. Because it's been cold. Temperature. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everybody knows this one here. And we got to take a break in about. You know what? Let's oh, take a break now. Before, let's take a break. When we get back, we do this. Yeah, when we get back, we'll talk about the the avocado that Craig has in his hand, because uh, who's who's thinking avocados in February? Ah, right? uh, nobody. Well, maybe. Although, they, although it is the number one right? uh, fruit for the Super Bowl, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So do stay with us. Uh, those on Facebook Live, any questions, comments for Craig or one of us, uh, let us know. Biz Talk Radio. We're taking a break for you specifically. Thank you for tuning in each and every week. 
as we uh, take a listen to some of our sponsors on BizTalk Radio. Do stay with us. Uh, this is Garden America back after these messages. And just like that, we are back from the break. Those on Facebook Live, those on BizTalk Radio, welcome. Uh, Tiger, myself, Brian Mang, Craig is in studio. Craig has brought in some fruit. We're guessing what it is. Right now, we're going to talk avocados. Yeah, and, um, you know, it is the number one fruit for the Super Bowl, right? They talk about, like, guacamole, avocado, Super Bowl, all that. Now, where did this avocado come from? Uh, this avocado came off my tree. That's awesome. Yeah, I have a, it's a beautiful avocado. <laughs> it, it, <you> sh- <laughs> the tree is even more beautiful. It's huge. Oh. And it produces a ton. It was actually the first thing my daughter ever ate. Now, did um, you say this is o- these are old avocado trees? It's a so the the house that we live in has is very old. It was built in the forties, um, and the tree was planted when the house was built. Wow, how about that for history? Yeah, and the, it's a it's a tree that's been well taken care of. the The thing I love about this fruit is it, it's the best tasting avocado I've ever had, and I'm not saying that because it's my tree. I mean, it is legitimately the best tasting avocado I've ever had. Now, like wine. <laughs> does the does the age of the tree have anything to do with that taste? I doubt that the age of the tree has anything to do with it. I venture to guess that it's just very old rootstock, um, okay. and over the last you know seventy plus years, We've... the tree the the science has grown and the and it's the varieties of trees. Too much have... modification. I don't know. I mean, I don't oh, know what, what I don't you know mentioned what... for the pomelo. It's it, they they focus more on maybe production Correct. and some other things versus the flavor. Also, you know, yeah. making things resistant to disease and to sure. different bugs to protect right. yeah. to protect the you know the crop of the state. Uh, but f- unfortunately, flavor is oftentimes not considered yeah. when they're making these changes. And as somebody who is a complete food freak and is all about the flavor, well, isn't flavor what it's all about? Yeah, yeah unless you're trying to make money, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> unless, you're yeah, move, unless you're trying to move a million right, tons right. of this stuff. So what Craig does, he says, "Hey, come here. You want you want to taste the 1940s? Mm-hmm. Yeah, here. there you go. To where I, to which I go, yeah, this is pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good avocado. Yeah, yeah, see. Oh. So yeah, so avocado that was really cool. Um, it's cool that it's from your tree, and it's February again. Yeah, you can uh, you can if you plant the right varieties of avocados, you can get avocados all year round. All year long. Shallow root system on your trees? Shallow but broad. Okay. Um, it, it, it's a, it's, my tree is probably in the drip line, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 feet across. Okay, yeah. Um, we just keep it short right? so that we can reach it. Well, that's, we, we talk about that with people who have fruit trees. You can, you can top them. You don't necessarily need a ladder if you want to top them and keep them, what, six, seven, eight feet, right? Yeah, oh. I think mine's about 10. Okay. All right. Last one here. What do you got there? A dinosaur egg. <laughs> uh, it's a chermoya. Chermoya. So it's green, almost looks scaly. Yeah. Um, looks a little about alien. the size of a baseball. They get a lot bigger than this. This is a yeah. small one that that fell out of the tree. I, I venture to guess this one probably isn't wasn't quite ready to come off. Um, but we had a lot of wind uh, a couple weeks ago, so a lot of the fruit was blown off the tree. Uh huh. Um, it's also a fruit that most people in the United States aren't terribly familiar with. Now, that's more of a subtropical, right? It, well, all of these are subtropicals. That's true. Um, yeah. But they're more popular in Asian yeah. cultures. Right. And you would see these in an Asian market, maybe. Oh, you'll see them in every Asian market, right, to be right. sure. Right next to the lychees and, and all the other fun stuff that, mm-hmm. for whatever reason, we don't eat here. So what, right. what would people use a cherimoya for? Is it just a pick and eat fruit? Is this something you mix with food? Um, they're kind of like an avocado. They need a little bit of time to kind of soften up on the counter. Oh. Um, so it takes a few days for them to ripen. In many cultures, they're dessert oh. because they're very sweet. So they'll take them and put them in a freezer. And they'll we'll cut them in half, put them in the freezer, but just long enough to kind of firm up. And then it's like ice cream. Oh. They have a really custardy flavor, kind of a grassy and custardy flavor, kind of like ice cream. And, and when they're really ripe, they're really soft. You can scoop it with a spoon. So you scoop it out, you don't eat the skin. No, you don't eat the skin. So you okay. are no longer in the restaurant business, right? Thankfully, no. Okay, you, you've seen, I was going to say the horrors, but people think it's very glamorous. I'm going to open up a restaurant, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It's very difficult. Now, all that aside, though, if if it was a perfect world and you could open up a restaurant, just based on what you're you're talking about this morning and everything you're presenting, I'm sure it would be a unique restaurant and you would do things different if you had the opportunity and there wasn't all the red tape. Yeah, um, I will never re- work in the restaurant industry again because it requires the pile of money that I was otherwise going to throw in the fireplace. <laughs> um, it's essentially the same exercise, right? Right. Um, based on success rates of restaurants, 
Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the whole reason I call my company Yard to Table Creations is because I'm making fun of the farm to table movement in the sure. restaurant industry because it's mostly nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's cost prohibitive. You know, only a tiny restaurant. So what? unfortunately, she just closed, but Garden Kitchen was a yeah. great place because she had 40 seats. She could actually order from local farms and be able to charge enough. But once you get much bigger than that, it, it's cost prohibitive to order food that way. Then you're forced to order food from some of the bigger purveyors because they're the ones that are going to sell it to you at a cost that you can then turn around and make a profit on because the business is a penny's business. And I would imagine a lot of food gets thrown away. It, and a astonishing amount of food that gets thrown would, away that we'd be just horrified if we knew how much food is thrown away between, based on the hunger in this country between restaurants and grocery stores uh, it's it's terrible uh, that's I, a whole I, story right there <laughs> yeah, you know? it's uh, to give you an example i opened up a small um grocery store with a kitchen in it which is one of my last chef jobs and uh a small organic grocery store was throwing away on average 150 pounds of produce a day jeez and that's yeah. at a small place. Yeah. And that's just because it's not pretty enough. It's when it starts to wilt or when yeah. it doesn't mean it's not good. It's no, just, it just but people won't buy people it. People just won't buy it. You know, I mean, you see it, you see it with grocery stores. I mean, it's the perfect oranges, it's the perfect lemons, it's the perfect apple. But we all know as being gardeners that you know, you get one perfect fruit out of maybe five yeah. actually on the tree. So we know as gardeners, there are four of those fruit that either went to the juicer or went to the trash can because, right, right. you know, they just couldn't see that actually making it to the grocery store. And and that's a real struggle, you know. And, you know, but, I mean, you go in other parts of the world and they don't mind the imperfect fruits and vegetables a lot of times, which is nice. I think here in, here in the United States, we've just been groomed to be like, oh, this – in order for me to eat this apple, it has to look Well, perfect. that's it. When you go to the supermarket, the produce, it's all about yeah. presentation. Everything's yeah. all shined up and waxed up and, and <laughs> you know, look at this. You know, my goodness. You know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah. Look at the fruit here we've got for you. And it's very limited. And unfortunately for a lot of people, like, like kids, they think that this all comes from the grocery store. They have no idea that somebody grew it. Yeah. 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 I used to run an after-school program before COVID, and I always started each 10-week session with the same question, which was asking these kindergarten and fifth graders where our food came from. And every single one of them said the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Never once did they ever say the ground, a farmer, yeah. anything. And it wasn't, in, you know, it wasn't until I told them, like, well, how the gr store didn't grow it. Yeah. You know? Nobody uh, perfect comes out of the back room there. To, to your yeah. point earlier about, you know, different cultures appreciating different aspects of food, a perfect example of that is oranges. We grow more oranges in the Central Valley of California than pretty much anywhere else. The vast majority of our oranges, because they come out spotted with black spots, end up in Australia. And many of the oranges that we actually have in our grocery store are imported from China. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so much for Florida and California, right? Yeah. 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 It, it doesn't make any sense. All right. Um, so that was fun in terms of what we're actually harvesting. All right. What are some things that you're doing right now in the garden? I mean, you know, obviously fruit trees, uh, stone fruits, they're getting pruned. They're getting pruned. They're getting sprayed. Um, the fruit trees are the big – It's that's the big winter project. Uh, it, many people won't grow a winter garden, and if you're not growing a winter garden, a lot, that's a good time to amend your soil fix your irrigation you know we're not running our irrigation so when irrigation tends to sit for a little bit uh, yeah. when you turn it back on 50 percent of the time something will break so it's good to go through your irrigation run everything make sure it's it's working but pruning your trees and then here in southern california spraying your trees is really important spraying with both horticultural oil for, uh, for the bugs but even more so the copper fungicide for fungus because we have leaf curl fungus in southern california like nobody's business yeah and trying to get in three to five applications of that is is re important and also can be difficult between because we have a short winter and we're getting a lot of rain so right. we don't have a ton of opportunities to actually apply these things to the tree in a in a manner where they'll have a chance to dry and then get in enough applications before we run out of winter which could be in three weeks yeah and and people don't realize they need to do these things now because they can't really do them later it's no. not going to fix it later. It well may... you'll also kill your flowers yeah so, I mean, you know, it's so funny because people learning that concept of, of spraying a tree sticks to protect them <laughs> from bugs and disease with leaves and flowers and fruit later mm -hmm. on. 
They just sometimes they're like, what do you mean? What do you mean I have to go spray my tree? I mean, I think it speaks to a bigger, the bigger problem with teaching people who don't live seasonably is getting them back to living a seasonable lifestyle and understanding that every time of the year there's something different to do, but you're never going to have anything the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hey, we've got a quick question before the break. Rick wants to know what you use on your trees. Worm castings, kelp. What, what do you use to make your trees look healthy or be healthy and look good? For fertilizer, uh, I don't use a ton of fertilizers. I try not to. Okay. Um, it's all about soil health. Compost, um, okay. having really rich humus in your soil. making it's more about the environment the tree is growing in. You, you know, I, I think it's a misnomer to say we're feeding our trees because really what you're doing is you're feeding your soil. Absolutely. You, if you have good, healthy soil and you have a good, a robust microbiome of- Good biology in that soil, Fungus right? and, and bacteria that are- at, Those are the organisms that are breaking down the organic matter into a small enough level that the trees can then take it up in the roots. So the tree will be fine as long as the soil is fine. Okay, we're going to take a break for our friends on BizTalk Radio. Do stay with us. Uh, those on Facebook Live, keep those questions coming as we continue our conversation with Craig. What's your last name again, Craig? Madden. Yeah, Madden, obviously. Craig Madden. I'm, I'm calling you Craig, which is very personable. But if people want to look you up or know you know exactly who you are, first and last name, Craig Madden, that's always good. Not John Madden, Craig Madden. <laughs> no, but if I... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a break. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. We are back for our friends on BizTalk Radio. This is the final segment of hour number one. You've got news coming up top of the hour, and hopefully uh, you catch us on hour number two. You can always catch us live, as we've mentioned, on Facebook Live every Saturday. We kick things off at 8 o'clock on the West Coast, 11 o'clock Eastern Time Zone. Uh, you can watch us live. You can interact, ask us questions. We are right there live on Facebook Live. Go to Garden America Radio Show, both on the website, Facebook, and our YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show. Carla was mentioning yes. that Sprouts is now selling bags of imperfect produce for less. They have a clever name for it that I can't remember. <laughs> Tried some of it, and it was good overall. And, um, you know, I think there's even a mail-order company that's called, like, Imperfect Produce or something. Imperfect Foods, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that will ship you boxes of produce, and, you know, you get it at a good deal, but it's going to come with some bumps and bruises but and little nicks in it and stuff. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, for – let me, not to harp on the the restaurant, but harp away. But I yeah. mean, the people don't ever see the produce because it's usually. I mean, unless it's a salad or something mm -hmm. that's left untouched and presented, people aren't seeing the the oranges. Mm -hmm. People aren't seeing the limes. People aren't seeing the celery that is going into their fruit food. But when they come out on the plate. It's mixed together. It should look beautiful. It should look appetizing. And so do restaurants use imperfect food a little bit more, or do they stick to the, it has to look good as well? No, I would say the restaurants, um, because they're it's all about the bottom line. It's all about the dollar. Uh -huh. Restaurants will actually or have been leading the charge in using ugly produce. Okay. And a lot of restaurants, unless, we're, unless it's a raw presentation where it right. needs to be perfect, it, there's almost no need for it to be perfect. Right. So if I can get that case of lettuce for 10 or 15 dollars cheaper just because it's got you know a few brown leaves on it that i can peel off or you know it got a little beat up you know if if or if, yeah. you know, if whatever if, if if i can get it cheaper that's better for the and bottom then, line of the restaurant yeah, sure. the clients won't notice it it doesn't make yeah. any difference and oftentimes a lot of times it's based on size uh-huh so you know a case of bell peppers when they're nice and big well that's great for labor purposes because it takes less time to break it down but I can get a case for half that price of smaller ones as long as I'm willing to pay somebody for the extra time to break it down. Oh. But oftentimes, the smaller fruit tastes better. Oh, yeah. That is true, right? They talk about that. Like, yeah. You know, when they see those big, massive fruits, those, you know, they don't taste mm -hmm. as good as some of the smaller varieties that are out there. So Produce and seafood. Yeah. When bigger necessarily isn't better, though? Not there? necessarily better. Okay. Um, we, so we have – you want to uh, – Yeah, I want to I wanna start. So you guys, you guys are going to have to talk for a minute, but – I have a taste test for you guys. Okay. Craig, is this your idea? This was my idea. Oh, okay, okay. So Craig, Craig, again, with his food background, and because we talked about people that just have a mass quantity of stuff, we, you've always been a been advocate for preserves, yeah. for jams, uh, 
what was the tomato tomato jam, jam yeah. tomato jam yeah. just things that you can make that extend the life of these fruits and vegetables to use later on and so preserves is a big thing so i brought in a selection of um jams and preserves and we're gonna have a taste test okay. i'm gonna give uh brian a piece and i'm gonna give craig a piece and since brian probably won't be able to guess as well as you i'm gonna say we're gonna go with brian first on like guess because um i think craig's gonna get these everyone and he, we're know, gonna see know. which just, just right. mean he has, you think he has a more trained palate yeah which fruit do you think went into these so you guys are gonna have to talk amongst yourselves for a second i'll get this ready oh, oh okay so so i guess what he's asking us is to um see if we know what the ingredients are in terms of what kind of fruit yeah okay okay i think we're supposed to guess the flavor here okay you know just to just to pick up on what um tiger was mentioning earlier about preserving um living seasonably you know, trying to get people away from not being able to have tomatoes year round I, oh, I want to have tacos and i want tomatoes for my tacos and it's february well maybe you should preserve your tomatoes that you grew instead of relying on something that was grown in right. southern mexico or peru sure or sure. You know, and then we shipped over here and right? and will not taste as good thank you sir okay okay so this is our first one and I, I, I'm, I'm trying to i'm trying to this is actually probably the hardest one out of all of them so you guys have to try to pick which fruit preserve that is. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and I, don't, I, I haven't even tasted all of these, so I don't even know if I can do this. <laughs> well, the flavor changes slightly from the first bite as you let it marinate on your taste buds. Oh, Craig will get this. Should I guess? Yeah. Apricot. All right. Craig, what's yours? Guava. Guava. So never one one zero craig yeah what? well i never you know what and i'm proud of my guess because <laughs> i don't know the last time i had guava <laughs> see that's the thing you know for me it's all about the smell i've smelled enough guava rotting on underneath people's trees that it it conjures up an instant image i just haven't smelled enough rotten things in my life <laughs> i guess believe me it's not that glamorous <laughs> <laughs> no cheating <laughs> no, I, I can't see it. I can't see it. They're all the same color. He's got the, he's got the, the uh, jar turned around. Okay, good. Yeah, this is like, you know, come on. <laughs> Let's see. This one, this one you should get this. All right. So, so we're on our second tasting of jam preserves. Um, and so – you know, we, we talk about preserves. Now, the, the process behind preserves are jams. Basically, you're taking a, a fruit, you're taking, um, you know, a vegetable, a berry, or something like that. And what is what is preserving it, Craig? Heat. Heat? Yeah, so you're essentially cooking it down um, to, uh, to a, a syrupy level. You know, a lot of people will add sugar. Um, you can also use, um, you know, gel different types of gelatins, pectins, mm -hmm. um, things to firm it up, and then canning it. So you're, you know, you're canning it with a canning jar and then heating it up uh, to over 165 degrees for at least 10 minutes. The, the jar. The jar, whole jar is because, sealed up. Because that's the whole thing, right? Yeah. That jar needs to be sealed. Sealed and heated so that all, any bacteria that might be in there are, are dead. Uh -huh. um, oftentimes when I make preserves, I'll also use some sort of a vinegar as a balancing flavor. I don't have a terrible sweet tooth. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, ter I'm not really into really sweet jams. I like a little bit more savory, so I'll balance things out with some apple cider vinegar here and there, which also helps to keep things clean. And then once you make it shelf-stable, then you can keep it indefinitely. Nice. What's your guess? Well, it tastes very marmalade to me. Okay. So marmalade? Yeah. What is, I don't know what marmalade is. is that, isn't that an orange? Yeah, or, or, orange, right? Orange, apricot? I mean, mar marmalade is, can be any flavor. Yeah. So what do you think? I'm, which or, flavor? Orange. You think orange? Or, orange slash apricot. <laughs> I'm going to go <laughs> with yours. Apricot. Apricot. Yeah, that was apricot. All right, yeah. I'll give you half credit on that one. Okay, yeah. You know, it's it's that's. See, I, my first thought was apricot, and I went, nah, yeah, it's not going to be. And so I'm going to stick with my first inclination. You know, it's it's also hard if 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 it's not a natural product, if it's a if it's a flavored product. Yeah, exactly. It's completely different. That's what, what the joke that my wife always makes is that purple should be a flavor, because nothing ever tastes like grape. <laughs> <laughs> So now we're going to go to something darker. Okay. This could get harder. We're, yeah. Your, your grapes, your boysenberries, your yeah. blackberries. Um, Blueberry, I mean. 
And we have nothing to cleanse our palate from. <laughs> So, I mean, and, and I think that's the biggest fear people have when it comes to jams and preserves is because is that whole bacteria, that whole cooking it to the point where because that's just it is you take this jar and you put it on a shelf. It's not in your refrigerator. It's not, you know, in your freezer. You, you, you take it, you put it on a shelf and you're so worried that when you open that jar and you eat it, that you're going to die because whatever. But have you I mean, when you know what? we got to take a break. Oh, OK, I'm over. All right. I get so caught up in Gee. what we're eating. I know we have to take a break for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. News coming up. We are back at six minutes after. This is Garden America. Happy weekend to you. Do stay with us here. Facebook Live, Garden America, and Biz Talk Radio. Okay, welcome back to Garden America. If you are tuned in on BizTalk Radio, this is our number two. Thank you for your support and supporting our many sponsors on BizTalk Radio. Facebook Live, thank you for your questions, your comments. As uh, we are back here, hour two on BizTalk Radio, Facebook Live, we just keep floating along with a taste test today uh, with Tiger, myself, Craig Madden is our guest in studio. Tiger? Yeah, and I was talking about, um, I was going to ask Craig, when when somebody makes a mistake or, or when maybe the jam or preserve goes bad it it tells you it goes bad i mean people aren't going to eat this stuff and then you know get horribly sick from it right like you know it's bad and you're like oh you know i something went wrong you throw it away i mean for the most part as long as you're paying attention that would be true i yeah. mean the, there's a few exceptions i mean botulism you can't smell or taste but that's also not common mm -hmm. um yeah and most of the time it's either going to ferment so it's going to start producing gas you're going to open the jar and it's going to you know, if you hear that, maybe maybe don't eat it. At the, <laughs> at the same time, if your jam is fermenting, it's just becoming wine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's right. I mean, you know, mead or wine. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, obviously, you know, use your senses. You know, yeah. smell it, taste it. If you know, it makes your mouth tingle, because that can happen with like pickles. Uh huh. People think that pickles can last, you know, forever in your refrigerator because they're pickled. Because they're pickled. Yeah. Because they're pickled. <laughs> they can last a long time, but. If you leave them in there long enough and you go to eat one, your mouth will start to tingle a little tingle? bit. Tingle? Really? Yeah, because it's 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 the it's it's fermenting. It's uh -huh. it's anaerobic bacteria, uh -huh. and so I you'll know it made you'll, your mouth tingle. Yeah, it'll, <laughs> it'll it'll make your mouth tingle a little bit, and that should tell you like yeah. maybe this isn't this isn't pop rocks. This shouldn't do this. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to say. I mean, you know, pop rocks are meant to tingle in your mouth. So, yeah. also you know, not a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. That would be fun as a chef if you could find that balance between tingling pickles. And getting people sick, <laughs> like, like just right? that, that fine line. You know, that's like that uh, that that blowfish blowfish sushi. You know, it's like, like that fine line of, am I going to die eating this, right. or am I going to enjoy it? I, but <laughs> is I it really take, worth the risk? <laughs> I, not me. Not me. <laughs> you know, a chefs can have a bad day. Yeah, exactly. I, I think you're going to have a worse day yeah. if that goes wrong. Yeah, no, I, that's what I'm saying. No, no thanks. All right, what's your guess on that? Well, one? you know, it's interesting because of the apricot still. When I bit into it, it had a taste, and then the taste kind of changed as I chewed it. Uh huh. And it went from what I thought it was to maybe something else. I'm going to guess grape. Grape? What's yours? I think it's cherry. Cherry. Really? Cherry. I did not taste cherry. In really? That at you didn't all. taste cherry? No, I think I still had. It tastes more like maraschino cherry. Oh. <laughs> okay. You know what? <laughs> Which is not really a cherry, is it? It's a cherry. It's just been, um, uh, what's the word, Hi highlighted. It's just been put some. It's like somebody stuck a red highlighter thing in the jar and yeah. then added a bunch of sugar. Yeah, because that's all it is is pure sugar that you'd order on a Shirley Temple or a, some of those foo foo drinks. It makes a good Manhattan. Yeah, true. I feel so like what I'm gonna do if, I, if because obviously I'm losing. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play um, uh, a couple of bars of songs, and Craig has to guess them. Yeah, that, that'll be <laughs> that'll even us up. One, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's the funny thing that yeah, John and Brian always do in here with me is they always talk about movies and songs, and I have no clue whatever they're talking about. I just don't know movies and songs in generals, but in general, but um, you always you guys always bring up old songs and movies. Well, I'm in the business. <laughs> movies I would lose. Songs I might be able to do. Yeah. Um. What do you got there, Brian? That's an apple. Apple. An apple, huh? App, what's what's that? Uh, I can't 
jam. It tastes apple-y to me. Craig, what is it? I, I, I'm gonna guess fig. I actually don't know. Strawberry. Oh, <laughs> that's a Schmuckers. That's a Schmuckers. I think that might be an example of a, it doesn't a- really a- taste a- like a apple, strawberry. Apple, um, yeah, it's, wow. It's a Schmuckers strawberry jam that tastes like apples and figs. <laughs> I don't feel so bad. That one would. I, I knew it had never gotten that one. Loading up on bread this morning, sourdough bread. <laughs> That's what, So when I, I, you know, I took your advice and smelled it, I just smell sourdough. Yeah. <laughs> Tiger. All right, this will be the hardest one of the morning here because there's m- multiple. Every, every every other one has been one single item. Okay, well, and there's seeds. I can taste seeds in this. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, the first inclination is what it probably isn't. What is it probably isn't? So, it's, yeah, so well, you it, think because there's seeds, because there's seeds, it's I not think, something that doesn't have seeds. I would think strawberry. Okay. My palate is like a ping pong ball right now. Uh huh. I couldn't well, taste chocolate from vanilla right now if I had to. It's not <laughs> chocolate or vanilla. <laughs> I'm gonna guess strawberry, but I don't. I don't feel good. But about I said that multiple. Guess. So there's multiple. Do you have any other guesses in there with strawberry? There's probably um, the darker fruit, blackberry, raspberry, something like that. Okay. What do you got, Craig? I was I was just gonna say like a mixed berry. I can't. Yeah. I mean, I know there's berries yeah. in there because you know, the berries. seeds. All right, so this is maybe a, cherry. This is a strawberry, cherry, okay. raspberry, okay. and currant. I got two out of them. Yeah, good job. Two. You got two. And if somebody said raisin, that would count as currant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so those are some jams in preserves. Some now, of those are homemade. Those, some of those are store bought. Because they're okay. Well, the store bought, we know that they have their own preservatives oh, yeah. and ingredients, mm-hmm. and it's well, not, I mean, that's not a just pure so, taste. That's just so funny because I will say Craig has a very impressive palate. I mean, you do this. You do this often, preserves, you've cooked, yeah. all of that. So it's so funny to me that the Smucker's Strawberry <laughs> Jam, who Craig has been spot on with every flavor so far this morning, he thought it was figs and you thought it was apples. I was just throwing a guess out there because I, ha- I <laughs> well, really didn't because know. Because it's not natural. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, you know. It didn't taste like stra- purple should be a flavor. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, not apple fritter. There, there's a jam. A jam. It's got apple. It's apple something, and it was uh, even. It even looked like that. It's kind of brown. Okay. And and it just to me tasted. Yeah. No, apple. there are there is like applesauce jams kind of a thing. So that's yeah, kind of totally. what I'm yeah leaning toward. It. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, that's very interesting. Do you have a Do you have a jam or jelly that you put that's on your favorite like? I. You know what I've been buying no sugar. But but what flavor? Really? I like raspberry, grape, cherry. I'm not a big jam guy, but when I do, it's those kind of flavors. So I am a huge like sauce and jam. Oh man, I go to the, I go to that aisle in the grocery what store. What sauce? Sauce what? I I'll, all of them. I, there's so many, right? You go to you go to where the mayo is in the oh yeah in the grocery yeah I know store, yeah sure. And they've got mayo with all kinds of flavors. They've got avocado hot sauce mayo. Flavors. They've got virgin they got all olive. kinds of sauces nowadays. Right. And you know, and then they have the the sauces like the Chick Fil A sauce mm-hmm. and the Polynesian Chick Fil A sauce, and the, you know all these other ones. I'm a huge, I, I that is trouble. Be, and the problem is, is like you have to buy the big bottle of it, yeah. And you, you never use the whole <laughs> <No>. thing like, <laughs> no. before it goes back. You know, that's <laughs> another thing is that people who live by themselves that are single. Oh yeah, it's tough to buy things in a small quantity. Certain products offer them, but not everybody, much to what Tiger's talking about. It's like, I'm never going to eat all this. Yeah. Well, I mean, we live in a culture of excess. You yeah. Know, where, I mean, if you really want to step up your sauce game, go to the Asian market. Really? And go walk down yeah. several aisles of sauces that like, you, it's a whole you, other world. You, you can't even read. You're just going to take a guess <laughs> yep. and see what happens. Yep. You know my biggest crutch is, or, is, or, or uh, that I just can't get enough of, is mayonnaise. Really? Yeah. You know what? Tuna sandwich, mayonnaise, mayonnaise on th- mayonnaise on things that you shouldn't put mayonnaise and, on. And, and mayonnaise, not what's the other thing? Aioli. Oh, oh no, but, no, oh, not um, not a miracle, miracle whip. whip. Oh, well, no. I got a funny story about that. When I was a kid, <laughs> my mother would say, "Okay, we're going to put some mayonnaise on this," and this it was miracle whip. She called it mayonnaise. Right? Uh-huh. 
okay, as a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old. To me, that's mayonnaise. Go to my friend's house. We're having lunch, and his mom's making hot dogs, and she put a little mayonnaise on the hot dog. Okay. And I bit into it. And I went, "Oh, this is so good! What is really? this?" Really? Well, she goes, "Well, Brian, it's mayonnaise. Haven't you ever had mayonnaise before?" And I went, "Not like this." Yeah. And I remember going home to my mom, and saying. Why have you been fooling me all these years? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Miracle Whip is just oil, salad right? Dress. Yeah. It's salad dressing, it's, isn't it's it? It's oil, right? It's, it's – so, uh, yeah, it, it's processed oil and emulsifiers. Okay. And then they add in, like, white vinegar and some flavor ingredients to make – Where, to where give mayonnaise it that, is egg. Well, mayonnaise and... is also oils. Aioli, which is what mayonnaise comes from, uh-huh. um, is, is egg yolks, um, an acid, usually lemon juice, and then – um, some sort of oil that's oh, emulsified okay. into. I it. was so mad at my mom. I got, and I said, <laughs> I don't want this anymore. I want you to go out and buy Best Foods mayonnaise. This yeah. is what I want. <laughs> well, well, okay. It's relatively easy to it make it. Takes you to home. frozen yogurt and says, "This is ice cream." <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> that's rude. Hey, we got to take a break uh, for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. Hey, do stay with us. Uh, those on Facebook Live, we're watching your questions, your comments, any questions for us. Just let us know. We have to take a break and pay some bills on Biz Talk Radio. Stay with us. All right, welcome back to uh, Garden America. If you're just joining us uh, at this point in time, Craig Madden is our guest, a food extraordinaire, has great taste buds. In <laughs> fact, uh, he invites you to uh, send uh, him some food. He'll taste it and tell you what it is. Yeah, not, exactly. Not just, really. Just, no. just random packages Ran- show random up on packages. his doorstep. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we are back. Uh, here we go. Miracle Whip was developed during World War II to minimize the number of eggs used in the recipe. Really? Oh, maybe that's going to make a comeback now with egg prices. From John and Bonnie. <laughs> See, we have great viewers and listeners. They, they, you know, we should, we should refer to them more. Uh, we love the trivia. Keep it coming. Well, you know, she, she touches on a good point, which is where a lot of all, all of this processed food came from. All came out of that first, uh, Second World, World War, War yeah. uh, baby boom. We actually didn't know how we were going to feed our Sp- country. Spam? Which I love. Good example. It's not I, good for I, you, but I love it. I know, but they used to, I mean, they, they, it, it's cheap and it goes a long way, and that's was a big uh, food item during World War II, right? Yeah, um, and it still is a main staple in my camping gear. Tom- oh, it's a good camping food. <laughs> Tom- Thomas wrote, we used watermelon rind to make pickles, relish, preserves, and chutney. Watermelon rind. Yeah, huh? that's 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 really common in the South and really common in, in Indian cultures. Really? Um, and, and also um, Arab cultures. Watermelon rinds. I would never have thought to use watermelon rinds for anything. You know, until you're hungry enough. Yeah. <laughs> you got to use every part <laughs> yeah. of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that we, we, we kind of covered some harvesting, what we're doing. Um, but for us here in San Diego County, like we mentioned, we are actually getting close to spring mm-hmm. and getting close to actually planting the, mm-hmm. the real vegetable garden, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what what are people doing right now? What are you getting ready for people right now to happen in the future here craig uh february for for us is generally start thinking about seeds mm-hmm. so if you're going to start from seed realistically we can start planting our our spring garden you know mid to late march um at least for s- some of the more hardy things tomatoes deal with with cold nights pretty well um so do the squashes uh so getting things like that started um getting them started indoors on a heating pad you, if you start seeds, you know the first couple of weeks of February, your seeds aren't really going to be transplant height and and age until about four or five weeks. Mm-hmm. So by then we're well into March, and if you get started early, then you get a good head start on your spring garden. Also, sometimes things go wrong in your garden, so if you get a head start, you, you can still, always make changes. You have time to make changes, fix things. We get a frost. You live in East County and. You get a frost that kills off your baby starts. Well, you started early. You got plenty of time to get yeah. Yeah. to get more in the garden. Yeah, and it's always good to not go all in at once, right? Like start off some. Yeah. And then, like you're saying, maybe a, a couple weeks later, start off with another group. Yeah, I like to start big with my biggest stuff. The things that are going to take the longest to grow. Mm-hmm. Get those in the garden first, mm-hmm. and then start working my way down in the amount of time it takes to so grow. So, what are best. some things that are going to be the longest to grow? Uh, winter squash, tomatoes, 
um, and and your summer squash. Uh, okay. Those are the, those are your biggest plants. Those are the plants that are going to need to get kind of big before they start really producing. And then I'll go back and fill in with some of the smaller things. I'll start putting in green beans in between the plants to grow above them. You know, we can start all through spring. We can still plant plenty of lettuce, uh, chard, kale does really well um, all the way until the really hot months of the summer. And then, you know, carrots, radishes, things we can grow year round here, start filling in seeding in between radishes everything. Radishes grow quick. Oh, those are 30 so days. They yeah. pop up in yeah. what, two weeks or whatever? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Um, so you've been doing yard to table creations for how many years now? I started in 2017. Okay. Are there some uh, vegetables that maybe have been introduced to you from customers? Like, you know, you, you got a new client and they said, hey, I would really like to grow this. And you're like, I have no clue what that is. Actually, it just happened last week. I had a oh. client call me. We were talking about the spring garden. She said, can, you, uh, can we grow kiwi berries? Kiwi? Kiwi berries. Oh, kiwi berries. And I said, I, do you mean a kiwi? <laughs> and she said, no, no, not a kiwi. It's like a miniature kiwi. They call them kiwi berries. Uh huh. I, and I don't have any idea. Let's, let's yeah. do some research yeah, and find out. out. What's this yeah. all about, right? And it turns out that it's actually a, a vine that should do well here. I've never grown it, but from what I've learned about it, it, it should do well. It's similar to passion fruit in the way that it grows and that it gets very big very fast and is apparently very productive and makes little tiny kiwis. I mean, this is something that you probably have to find on online and mail order? Or? I haven't even started looking oh, for it. Okay. I've never seen it in a nursery. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm assuming I would either have to get seeds or, or I'd have to, like, a specialty, you know, plant Yeah, place. you'd have to find some place online that can sell you a little star. Logies or something, or something yeah. like that. Here, yeah. Here's a comment uh, from John on Facebook. He's having a slice of homemade bread with his homemade pomegranate Ooh. horse horse di- horse radish. <laughs> yeah, horseradish jelly Whoa. Made, with, made with Splenda. So that's like a sweet and spicy it sounds jam. Good. Homemade yeah. pomegranate really good. horseradish jelly made with Splenda. I've never used horseradish in jam, but I think I'm going to have to try it. Yeah, that. right? It's that whole, what, salt versus sugar. Yeah, the, yeah. the sweet two, and savory. You know, opposite tastes. Well, I, I make one that's uh, apricot and habanero. Ooh, yum. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Yeah. And, I mean... That sweet and that sweet and spicy play with flavors is always so good because I, I like spice on food and you know yeah, but I I'm do, not I too much you, right you know I don't like to be crying afterwards <laughs> but I unlike Craig I do have a sweet tooth and so anytime I can get the both of those happening on one meal I'm excited so <laughs> let's speaking of hot Craig I have a theory because I don't handle hot well mm-hmm. I can eat a pepperoncini. That's about my speed. Okay. And then you see the, Car- the Carolina <laughs> Reapers and the ghost peppers and uh-huh. these people. It's got to be within your DNA if you're able to handle hot. I, I just can't. And other people are like, eh, not bad. I'm sure there's a genetic component to it. But I, I also I can v- vouch just from having met so many people in the restaurant industry. A lot of it is cultural. It's just what you're used to. Yeah. You know, if you, you start. You you can build up a, a, a tolerance oh, yeah. to it? Yeah, I, yeah. Think so. I mean it's it, it's a physiological response yes. to capsaicin, so you that you somewhat you can't control that to some Pick extent. Pickups, sweating, I can't control well, that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what is the food that comes in grades? Thai food? Oh or yeah, Indian. You know, Thai, thai food, food, right? Yeah, Thai yeah, food. and you order it. You order a number, and it all depends on who's cooking that night. You never really know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but you order a number, and you know, people from that culture, they probably can tolerate a higher number because they're yeah. accustomed to it. Well, and it's people. cultural too, in, yeah. and especially when it comes to Thai food, and as well as other Asian cultures like uh, Japanese, are really big into texture, temperature, you know, the contrast in flavors. That's why you see, you know, in in a lot of cultures, you know, most cultures, it's family style serving yeah, where it's all these different sauces. With, yeah, right, right, right. And it's so you can get all those different experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Veronica says bell and jalapeno jam is awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've had jalapeno jam. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of jalapeno jam. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. And I'll stick with my pepperoncinis for right now. <laughs> you know, you what know what I've was. been I've been um, uh, eating a lot of is that jalapeno jam with a little bit of some cream cheese on like a cracker. Uh huh. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, like I, I I I really don't eat jam on a sandwich. It's almost always on a charcuterie and cheese board. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that, that's where we'll have three or four different kinds out there and same thing. You know, we want all the different combinations. Like what does this cheese yeah. taste like with this jam? With this, and <laughs> with this piece of cheese, with this jam, with, with this, this salami, salami yeah. with this nut. And you have yeah. so many different ways you can do it. Right, you never yeah, get right. bored. 
We're going to take a break. We have two more segments coming up, uh, those on Facebook Live and uh, those listening on BizTalk Radio. We thank you so much. I think more people on Facebook Live actually listen to us than watch us, and that's fine, too, because you're still getting the information. <laughs> Our guest is Craig Madden in studio today. John is off. I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Back even quicker on Facebook Live. Stay with us. All right, we are back from the break. Uh, BizTalk Radio, Facebook Live, enjoying your comments, uh, the different uh, variations of what you like and don't like, and your recipes, and uh, passing them on to us on Facebook Live. Craig Madden is with us, um, knows so, what he's doing. He's, he's the, the taster of food. He's the preparer of food. He's the... Uh, <laughs> the the, the uh, preparer, the grower of food. The grower of food, <laughs> yeah. and uh, so, from, from so, the yard to uh, table. <laughs> yeah, I, I just went backwards in the food shade from cooking it yeah, to growing you, it. Yeah, you went the reverse direction. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing, you know, give us a, a geologic region that you work in. Because, I mean, we're in San Diego County here. How far north is the property, the farthest north that you go for a property? Uh, I I have clients in Oceanside. I have clients okay. in Valley Center. I have okay. clients in Bonita, Chula Vista, I, all over the county. Yeah, so, I mean— your experience for different fruits and vegetables all over different microclimates, um, you know, it's it's just got to be kind of really amazing to kind of put that all together, you know, to compile all that information, to look at these clients and say, yeah, this one's in Bonita. They've had great success with this, but this one's in Oceanside, and we've tried it a number of times, and it's never worked. Um, and it, a lot of the time, it's just the exposure and where it's at. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It turns into a, like a nonstop, never-ending guessing game. Mm -hmm. um, I try to keep really detailed notes yeah. on each of my clients' gardens because that's the only way I can track this stuff. Right. But being able to look back from one year to the next, oftentimes, just creates more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I get clients all the time who are asking me, "Well, how come this is happening?" And oftentimes, my answer is, "I'm gonna have to find out." Yeah. yeah, because I I don't know right off the bat. I mean, I can tell okay, there's too much shade here, or yeah. or if it's sitting in really wet soil. Yeah, for I mean, three weeks you're like it's being overwatered. Yeah, there's yeah. some obvious things, but oftentimes it's you know, well, let's try and grow this plant over in this box, and sometimes it does better, and I don't always know why. It, but the important part is I figured out where it will grow. Right, and the question for you, uh, Craig, do you think it's too late to plant pea seeds here in the coast in Southern California? I know it depends on the weather, so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's getting a little late to start anything from seed, but if you were going to start a seed, pea Hur is probably up. <laughs> pea, yeah, well, pea is probably also the the easiest because it has such a fast germination rate. Um, it'll germinate within a couple of days sometimes if the situation's right and the soil's warm enough. And, um, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But but at this point, if you're trying to plant anything for cool weather, I would be going with transplants at this point. And uh, another question: When do you plant corn seeds? And they're in the Poway area. Uh, it, it, you want to make sure the weather's warm enough where you are. Uh, so, so wait it, about a month, maybe. It, I would wait longer than that. Actually, okay. I, I think for corn, it needs to be fairly warm. They like the heat and they like really warm soil for germination. So if your soil is not over, you know, seventy three, seventy four degrees, it's not likely that it's going to okay. germinate at all. And yeah. I find it's better to germinate corn indoors instead of direct sow um, because of the rodents. Oh, it's true. Yeah, the birds the, and rodents will come and eat dig the them corn up. Yeah. real quick. First thing and they for, go for, yeah. Yeah, for Poway, I mean, you're probably looking at not until April, you know, at with, least, maybe right? at least. Yeah, I would say I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even try and plant because corn we, until we'll April. get a, a hot spell, then it, it'll get cold again. Well, it's yeah. not, and it's not about air temperature; it's it's all about soil temperature. Mm -hmm. Soil temperature and hours of sunlight are the two things that control everything a plant does. And does not 
those temps uh, affect the soil in some way or not? Yeah, obviously the ambient air temperature is going to affect okay. the soil, but just because it got to 85 degrees for a couple of days doesn't mean that was long enough to warm your soil exactly. up enough to actually germinate right. the seed. And, that, and that's my point about the, the hot and cold and hot and cold here that we experience in Southern California, especially getting into this time of the year. We get a weekend of hot weather. People are going to the beach next weekend. They're snow skiing. Well, I think here, yeah. you know, here we're blessed that we're, that our weather is so good. But dealing with the weather is far more nuanced because in other parts of the culture, it's somebody like eventually Mother Nature slams the door shut, and yep. there's no question. But for us, it's, it's like, oh, you can't, well, maybe. it's kind of this, sometimes this. You it's know, right next to my house, so it's yeah. not going to get <laughs> too, super cool. Yeah. yeah, you know, I uh, like a lot of us who garden. I take chances when they say you can't grow that. Really, mm -hmm. watch. Me. And sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. And it's okay to fail. With new gardeners, though, they fail once, I can't grow anything. It's like, well, hold yeah. on, hold yeah. on. What did you try to grow it's first? A, it's a perishable skill that requires right. you to learn and then practice. Exactly. You, you, know, in, in, you know, I mentioned the egg issue earlier right. in the show. And, you know, you mentioned daylight hours and temperatures. People don't realize that chickens are also affected by mm -hmm. that. So. People will say, oh, my chickens don't produce in the wintertime. You know, what do I do to make them produce? No, they've done research. Chickens require a certain number of daylight hours mm -hmm. and temperatures to produce a, a good amount of eggs, you mm -hmm. know. And so they're like a plant mm -hmm. where during different si seasons, different cycles, they, they also have cycles that they follow. And it's all based on nature because nature knows if – the chicken lays an egg when it's freezing outside. Yeah. That egg isn't going to live. Yeah. So and so, what is the real reason you have chickens at, at your nursery? For fun. For fun. Well, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah. That's the first <laughs> thing I do is I go chase the chickens. Yeah. I mean, it's, exactly. when I was working there, it was a lot of fun to find all the random eggs. Oh, they, it's like oh, an yeah. Easter egg hunt. Oh, yeah. All over the place. Random. Huh? All over the place. Really? There was oh, yeah. one that would go into someone else's house and lay eggs in their house. <laughs> During the day, this chicken would escape the nursery, go to their house, lay its eggs, and then come back. Come on in. Yeah, so funny, right? Wow. Yeah, you don't mind we, if I we have found a baby like twenty in the eggs in there one time. We're like, what? We didn't. We had no clue it was happening. <laughs> so yes. how many? How many do you lose? What do you, do you find them just like eggs or chickens? Chickens. I mean, obviously. Oh, I don't know. They I don't. don't they track. don't go away to die. They die on the property. I or they get eaten. Yeah, <laughs> I think they. I think that's more. We've had. We yeah. We've had a couple chickens die on the property. You're right, but more likely they disappear. And that's, a, that's, and that's convenient for everybody. Yeah. You just, can you just kind of disappear? Disa yeah, they're like the mafia. <laughs> they yeah. just disappear people. Say, what happened to the chickens? Hey, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Uh, let's oh. see. But, yeah, so, I mean, you know, you know nature, w people try to challenge nature all the time, you know, by planting yeah. early, by, by m preventing frost or all these things, which is fine. But if if you like Craig are in the business of being successful, mm -hmm. you're, you, it's in your best interest to plant with nature. Yeah, and I, not try yeah. to push the thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I am a fan of trying to see what yeah. I can get away with. But that, I have a nonprofit garden that I work in that I can play in all I want. Yeah. When it comes to my clients' gardens or no, even even in my own around. garden, it's you're hedging your bets all the time. You're trying to guess what's going to happen in a month, three months. Yeah. You know, you're trying to. You know, I follow the weather a lot. I become like a you know, armchair meteorologist yep. at this point, just trying to figure out like <clears throat> what's going on with our weather, what's our spring going to look like, what's summer likely to look like based on you know the El Nino La Nina cycles, mm -hmm. and trying to figure just it, that's all you're doing all the time. Yeah, yeah, you are becoming a, a meteorologist <laughs> in so many different ways when you manage a garden. Um, Do you rely at all on the farmer's almanac? I don't because it never applies to San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where. Why the John's theory? John, yeah, yeah, John hates it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great if you live in Virginia; it's yeah. probably pretty accurate. Well, and that's where it all came from, anyway. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah, but for here, I mean, yeah. that's that's the case in gardening. I mean, when you see gardening advice, gardening books, gar everything is always based on this East Coast yep. gardening mentality. That's why you know that's why you have so many people that grew up here or live here that are writing books just about Southern California growing because yeah. it's really not like anywhere else. It's a, right. the East Coast bias, whether it's what you're referring to or sports. Or just news in general, what's happening, it's all East Coast. And it's like, no, you know what? Hey. Here. Well, and this country is huge. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah, so yeah. many different climates. It, it, you, there's no, there is no one size fits all for anybody. It right. really comes down to just your own experience. Yeah, the next time you fly across country, look down and go, there's a lot of land here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's no people here.
Yeah. I have a friend from Europe That's who Texas. said he said in, in Europe you can drive for four hours and go through three countries, and yeah. in here you can drive for four hours and you're still in the same state. Or unless we are talking about. Maryland, Washington, Philadelphia. That's the only time where, where you can do almost that as far as driving through several states. But then you have traffic. But you have traffic. And, and you're right, though. Texas, Wyoming, I mean, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, you name it. Yeah, there's – it's a day. Texas, two days probably to drive through Texas. Well, it's, you drive to Texas, through Texas, and past Texas. Past Texas. <laughs> so what's, what's happening in the future for you, Craig? Uh, yeah, 2023, to, Craig. A lot. Yeah, yard to table – you guys adding gardens? So this is you... going to be a big year. Yeah, um, yeah. The the you know the gar- the garden business is growing every year, um, and that's <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs> yeah, like that. Um, also, I'm also moving into the nonprofit world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're turning the uh, Bancroft Center for Sustainability, which used to operate as a nonprofit, back into a nonprofit where we can offer um, free education and gardening to the community Good. around us. Building you know garden beds for people who can't afford to build their own teaching classes every weekend on site for people to come and actually learn how to garden what take about those kids? skills what about getting into the all schools? about the kids um, we're yeah. working with another nonprofit who owns the property who's actually getting a commercial kitchen built mm. so we'll be able to actually start taking the food that we're growing from the garden and donating to to uh, San Diego Youth Services but we'll actually be able to start hosting cooking classes actual yard to table garden to table um, cooking classes and I am big on teaching youth uh, mostly because you can completely change a child's world when it comes to their perspective of food in just a tiny amount of time when you Absolutely. give them some experience and some responsibility in the garden. I've watched it happen. I've gotten emails from parents. How did you get my kid to eat this? And like, well, number one, I'm not you. <laughs> and number yeah. two, I gave them I gave them the responsibility. And I, they grew it. Ownership. It's, it's them, and it's like, look what I did, Mom. Yeah. Dad. And it's – Got to take a break. We, and we'll come back, Craig. Sorry. Uh, one more segment coming up here on Facebook Live and BizTalk Radio. Thank you for your comments, uh, your questions here and there. We're going to take a break. And, again, one more segment before we wrap things up with Craig Madden here on Garden America. Stay with us. Okay, we are back from that break, a little longer on BizTalk Radio, much shorter on Facebook Live. As we uh, wrap things up with our uh, final segment here on Garden America, Craig Madden is our in-studio guest. Uh, John is off this weekend, and uh, next weekend we may or may not be in studio, but we will have a show, and yeah. we'll figure that out, Tiger, as we... <laughs> we'll figure as, as we, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep you all we'll, guessing. Yeah, we'll figure that out this week, but we will have a show next week. It may be from someplace <laughs> else, not the studio. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> anyway. Sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah. We we're, we're gonna we're trying to do a show from um, John John's house. house. He has right. a beautiful library, garden book library. And are we, did we plan on taking cameras outside and, and I doing think all so. That? I mean, I think we will be able to to some extent. To all some right. extent, we're gonna try to keep it simple this time to uh, hopefully make it successful. So, um, so Craig, you were mentioning though, you know, yard to table creations, working with the nonprofit, the bank uh, Bancroft Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, Working with kids, mm-hmm. learning about how to cook on all, and also where their food comes from. Yeah, I think uh, you know the only way to have real control over your own nutrition is to grow it yourself. Yeah. Um, one thing we we can briefly touch on is that the nutritional value of commercially grown food is dropping because the nutritional value of the soil it's grown in is dropping. Oh. So by growing your own food at home, you can actually get full nutritional value out of the food that you're eating. Um, I think these skills are these are primal skills that all people are going to be satisfied emotionally uh-huh. um, and just giving somebody who has otherwise struggled through their life some empowerment mm-hmm. some control over their own destiny you know I, i've never met anybody who got in the garden and went you know what this is no fun yeah <laughs> no yeah um, so being able to provide uh for people who can't necessarily afford my my regular service through my company but be able to provide some of the same services to people who arguably need it more than anyone else in our in, in our society and and i mean you know i mean i'm not trying to be gloom or doom but you know we all talk about when when times are tough out there we just talked about egg prices we're talking about all these prices going up everywhere across the world you know if you do garden economically sound Mm -hmm. you know you start things from seed Mm -hmm. you grow what you need and should grow um it could be economically economically be good Sure. You know, people always talk about, oh, that's so funny, you know, the $20 tomato. And yeah. There is truth behind that sure. when you really think about buying the soil, buying the fertilizer, buying the plant, planting it, growing it. It could be very costly. 
Mm-hmm. But if you have tomato seeds and you simply put them in some rich soil that's amended with maybe free compost or something, and then you grow that plant, that's a very economical way to sure. grow it, right? I mean, yeah, there, there's an upfront cost to building a garden, definitely, um, just to getting, the, like you said, getting the materials to build it out. But that's that's the brunt of your cost at that point. Also should mention that people are used to prices that aren't real. Yeah. The prices you pay for the food in the store is all because of government subsidy. It's not because that's the actual cost of what it costs to grow that yeah, the produce. Farmer, the farmer you know, paid a lot more for that. But then was subsidized by the government Correct. when it got to the grocery store. Exactly. So he gets his money. Yeah, yeah and, that's, gets, and yeah. most commodity farmers, that's how they survive. They're not surviving off the actual cash crop. They're they surviving never make off it, of, of would a, they? No. Yeah. No, they wouldn't. And and that's that's really unfortunate. Um, and that's part of the reason why I am always pushing people to take control of their own. You know, I I would like to start in the next couple of years taking the idea of a community garden and making a community farm. You know, where it's a farm that as long as you come and volunteer X number of hours a month, well, then you're going to get a CSA box every time you leave. Yeah. You know, just uh, we're kind of doing something like that with a food forest at Bancroft. We just planted somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 trees. Yeah. We had about 15 trees that are fairly mature at this point. And the whole point is just to have a food forest that's accessible to the public. There's a giant um, uh, homeless population in the area where the garden is. And if they need to eat it. There it is. Plant apricots, yeah. plant out, and, you and know, maybe avocados, they can volunteer. Yeah. citrus, tons of citrus. Yeah. They can volunteer, keep them busy as well, maybe. Yeah, yeah I mean, in I, some I, instances. I definitely hope to, you know, get programs like that up and running. Luckily, working in partnership with San Diego Youth Services, they have a lot of programs like this already. Mm-hmm. They focus on the youth, but it's not a far stretch to start, you know, a homeless outreach program where we can get some homeless people in the garden and send them home with some food. Give so them, so give regarding, some, real quickly, the, the farmers and the government subsidize money. Has it always been that way, even going back, or is this a recent thing? Post maybe? World War II. Post War, yeah, okay. It, yeah. Was, it was all in that same movement. It's the same. It's you know, it's all the companies that got it's into. It's after the thirties, into the forties. Well, it was it was the baby boom. I mean, you got to remember in the fifties, they genuinely the government was concerned about feeding our population, right. which was exploding at a rate that had never been seen before. After the war, and people so, had babies. But yeah. and and just like everything, everything this all came from good intention. But right. then money got involved. Yeah. And then money kind of corrupts the system, and now it's about making money and not producing necessarily food. And you can make a pretty strong argument that a lot of stuff that's sold as food is not actually food. And from a biological level, your body doesn't recognize it as food. And, yeah. and isn't, you know, speaking of money, that's in just about every aspect of life and society. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's corrupt. Yeah. There's so much corruption. I mean, it, as soon as money becomes the dominant factor, you know, you have to question everything else right. attached to it at that point. And so, again, back to your own garden. Yeah, maybe it costs a little bit of money up front, but A, you're experiencing the real cost of growing food, yeah. and number two, you are getting a better quality product than you're ever going to get from a grocery store, and you get the satisfaction of knowing you grew it yourself, which in my book also makes it taste better. Yeah, and you know, and then again, economically, when you buy a head of lettuce at a grocery store, it's a real simple, people, you know, it's $1.99, 99 cents. You don't always use that whole head of lettuce <laughs> because, you know, you use a bit of it and then it goes bad or whatever, right? Yep. When you're growing lettuce in your garden, you have the luxury to walk out there, pick off. What if you, you If you have a sandwich, mm-hmm. pick off two or three leaves. The rest of the lettuce stays there. Mm-hmm. You can go back out there the next day, mm-hmm. and it's still there. And you can go out there the next day. And you can harvest, you know, as you need it. So it makes yep. it a lot better choice. And as long as you're able to adjust your life to that. Yeah, you know that's the that's the key is cha- it's changing your habits, right? Yeah. But once you realize the freedom that it gives you, you know, I I don't want to be Mr. Conspiracy UFO JFK <laughs> guy here. I'll but put I on am. a tinfoil hat. Um, I don't know that uh, they want us to be self sufficient. I you know I did I, you I, not see this Pomelo. <laughs> conspiracy theory? Yeah. This came from Mars. But but you know what I'm I'm getting at. Yeah. Like, no. We, I, now we no longer need you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course you're ruining somebody's revenue stream. You know, I'm I'm all for that. Let's ruin let's ruin revenue streams. <laughs> and th- but then there's a lot of people that are lazy, and uh, you know, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Well, you know? th- I don't I don't know if people are necessarily lazy or that they're just busy. I mean, I had I don't to, know any better. Maybe I literally had to turn this into a business in order to have the time to do it. You know, I can understand yeah. somebody who's working ten hours a day, six days a week, has kids in sports. You know that are that are leading very busy lives. It's really difficult. Like you have to make a concerted effort. It's like going to the gym. You have to make yourself go to the gym. You have to make yourself get out in that garden, even when you don't want to. Uh, Kevin's got a question. Kevin, um, can you wait till next week because we have to wrap things up? 
and or maybe we can answer him off Facebook. Yeah, I'll answer him. It's uh, Kevin Lawrence, so uh, hold that thought, and, and we'll try to get an answer to you. Craig, thank you so much for coming to the studio. Thank you. And we'll see you again next week, right? I hope so. Yeah, look, he's ready to go anytime. <laughs> thank you so much. Hey, for the entire crew, uh, Tiger Palafox, John Magnasco, Craig Madden, thank you so much. I'm Brian Main. Have yourself a good rest of your weekend, a good week, and we'll see you again next week, not from the studio, but someplace else. So be sure to tune in to Garden America here on Facebook. Take care. Biz Talk Radio, thank you as well.